Good afternoon on the Encounters and the Albacete Forum's behalf. Welcome everybody. I am Camille Martinez and I will moderate this event. We have an amazing panel for today. Dan Bushman is a husband and father of three children residing in Minnesota. He has worked in the medical technology consulting space for the New York tri-state area for 15 years, serving as a technical director and CTO. Dr. Anthony Lekic is an internist geriatrician with long experience in the care of the frail elderly. Since 1993, he has been an Arch Care Medical Director at Terence Cardinal Cook HCC, Mary Manning Walsh Nursing Home, and currently of the Special Needs Plan of Arch Care. He has been a workshop pres presenter for the American Medical Director Association on, on Nursing Home Palliative Care and has served as a mentor to students and attending physicians in his care. Heather King is an award-winning writer, an author, columnist, speaker, workshop leader, and blogger. She speaks nationwide, contributes monthly to Magnificat magazine, and writes a weekly arts and culture column for Angelus News, the Archdiocesan newspaper of LA. I have to say uh, very quickly to introduce this talk that I knew Monsignor Lorenzo Albacete personally during the last six years of his life. I arrived to New York when I was 29 to pursue the path of my vocation and being both Puerto Ricans, he was very overprotective of me. <laughs> the first time I drove in Manhattan, I got into an absurd accident, just a car just bumped into me while I was on a traffic light. Nothing really happened, but I didn't know what to do, so I called somebody from my house to ask what was the protocol. Monsignor was in the car with her, and 10 minutes after, I see her running towards me in the middle of the streets of Manhattan, like freaking out because Monsignor told her that she had to come rescue me. <laughs> I was 29. I think I could handle myself. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he did not want me to ever suffer absolutely anything. But later on, when I began to struggle a little bit with my vocation, he did not come to rescue me. He accompanied me. When it came to serious suffering, to the life, to what matters in life, he was not one to block your suffering or try to solve the problem. He was one who would take your hand and accompany you and tell you not to be afraid because he was certain that there was a call from God inside of every suffering. So he would treat it very delicately, not come running to just take you out of it. <laughs> For everything else, he would take me out of problems. <laughs> <clears throat> As uh, Cardinal O'Malley put it in the foreword of the new Monsignor's book, Cry of the Heart, he says, Lorenzo's profound reflections are teaching us how to say yes to the, living, to the life giving cross, to find meaning in the mystery, and to be able to read in the cross the greatest love story ever told. That is what I learned with him, and that is his voice, his particular voice. And I would like us to all together right now hear his voice. Let's hear it. The world of suffering reveals that all suffering is related, that something has happened, something is wrong that goes beyond the particular manifestation of suffering. It remains the question with which the greatest minds have struggled, the scandal, a breakthrough into our world of need answers. There is no answer, no theoretical answer to suffering. To provide a theoretical answer, I believe, is an injustice to the sufferer. that leads one to reduce the person to an object and 
all of suffering becomes a technical problem that requires fixing. But you cannot treat human beings as objects. Suffering is a cry. It is a dialogue or questioning with God and of God, seeking to make sense of being, called to be and wanting to be and trying to be a true protagonist of life. It is a mystery of faith. Our response then to it is the reality of co-suffering, to walk along with the sufferer towards that God, to walk along in asking that God, to do so together, to risk our own sense of being someone by accepting the question, the challenge, the cry that such a phenomenon or a reality leads us to. Because it is there that we are going to penetrate and find the response inside God himself. So now we're going to start with Heather King. Okay, is this on? Can people hear me? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Camille. Oh, gosh, I'm so um, excited and nervous and humbled and honored to be here. And uh, um, I will just say, unlike everyone else here, I think, who knew Monsignor intimately, I had the honor of meeting him just once. Um, <clears throat> it was at a Crossroads event that took place in 2010. Obviously, there was something deeply compelling and intriguing about the man because that one night has stayed with me ever since. Um, I just want to talk about it a little bit because uh, so the two of us were, so, were to have a conversation that night. It was at the American Bible Society. And he was late, like not five or 10 minutes late, but like a half, you know, it was, he was like quite late. And, um, and when he finally arrived, he just smiled. He warmly shook my hand. He looked me in the eye and he just said, I'm late, I'm sorry. No groveling, no shame, but sincerely sorry. And that stayed with me, that alone. I could see he was suffering. His black vestments were speckled with white flakes. When we sat down, his hands trembled under the table. He let me do most of the talking that night. But I think what I felt was just love. And I feel it in this room, right? Look at this. Look at all gathered for him. Um, total acceptance of me, who we'd never met, of the situation, of the people in the audience, and suffering but seemed totally at ease somehow, totally at ease with himself and comfortable. So afterwards, we're sitting at the table, and people are coming, just before people are coming up to talk, not so much to me, but to him, appropriately. <laughs> um, he somehow communicated to me um, that he cared for a brother who was emotionally and mentally ill. And he said, I promised my mother, I promised her on her deathbed. And he didn't say it like that with a lot of drama. I'm super melodramatic. But there was not an iota of self-pity. There was not a shred of, isn't this noble of me? It was, again, this very matter of fact, just the way he said, I'm late, I'm sorry. But he got this across to me, and, and I, in retrospect, it was like he was telling me who he was, what he was about, th the ground of his life. He was saying, this is my cross and my crown. And we emailed a bit after, and he said, and apparently, as he said to all, his, all the people he knew, I beg your prayers. He would say, I beg your prayers for Manuel. And, uh, so anyway, that was Monsignor Albacete, a total self-offering of his person, his gaze, his gestures, his presence, that only deepens with cry of the heart, his newest collection. Um, I want to say I can't, I can't say enough about the um, biography by John Chewy with which the book concludes, um, knowing the outlines of Monsignor's uh, personal struggles and suffering casts a whole illuminating glow backward upon, upon the words that I had just read. Um, 
So as I've alluded to, and probably everyone knows, Manuel, Monsignor's younger brother, suffered from psychological problems that would eventually be diagnosed as obsessive compulsive disorder with borderline schizophrenia. And I guess he was nocturnal, pretty much, right? <laughs> um, so you could say, as apparently many have, that Monsignor could have produced so much more, been more of a presence in the world, written more books, given us more of himself, if he hadn't pledged himself to care for Manuel. And in a way, to me, cry of the heart is a response to that very question. The short answer, as Alba Sete points, it, maybe this, points out, is this. Today's Western culture is incapable of dealing with personhood. And to me, maybe a longer response would how to be, how do we know that without the suffering of caring for both his mother and Manuel, any such work remotely would have had the depth and breadth and richness of what Monsignor did produce and what he did leave us. That's the mystery we will never know. Um, it can't be by accident that in the course of the book, Monsignor points to the passage in the Gospels where Peter finds out that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be killed. And, and of course, he says, oh, no, Master, that cannot be. And Christ replies, get thee behind me. And Monsignor adds, the inability to share that suffering, to co-suffer, to love, that is a diabolical reality. It separates, divides. You're not willing to co-suffer with me. You are Satan. So um, the first essay, there's so, I mean, you could just take any page from this book and talk for it's so rich, but I'll just pick out a few things that really struck me. In the first essay, A Mystery to be Lived, considers a particular kind of existential suffering. Albacete quotes Emmanuel Mounier, the founder of the French personalist philosophical movement. And Mounier wrote that the most important aspect of human life is a divine restlessness a divine lack of peace within our hearts. It is a permanent search for the meaning of life, an interest imprinted on unextinguished souls. Um, this questioning, I would add, is also diametrically opposed to our culture, which it encourages a kind of low-grade, lifelong catatonia, right? It's like, listen to your mindfulness app and take a cleanse and... Um, <laughs> Practice self-care. I come from New England where we just don't believe in any <laughs> nonsense like that. But, you know, and as much as, much as okay, it's wonderful self-care, but you get it. It's, um, it doesn't address the deepest hunger of our hearts, right? And then on top of it, I say this as someone who turned 70 last year, like Western, nothing in Western culture equips us to deal with the fact that this restlessness intensifies as we age. It's not like you mellow out. It's, you hear the clock ticking, right? And it's like, whoa. And everyone's, oh, just check off those items on your bucket list. And you know, you're dying of, you're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, so, so this was a great consolation to me, this passage. Um, and so is this from John Tuohy's biography. He, John writes, Lorenzo became his younger brother's helpmate and protector, aiding him with his homework, encouraging him in the many moments that he was overcome by fear, constantly making jokes to ease his mind and spirit. And then he writes, over time, Manuel grew jealous of Lorenzo's gregariousness and the public attention he received. Okay, Manuel was jealous of Lorenzo. For some reason, this made me laugh out loud, maybe because I have seven siblings. Um, <laughs> but isn't that just the twist of the knife that real suffering has? You know, you want to say to the person, you might be jealous of me if I didn't have you to contend with. <laughs> and I feel like, you know how the saints have attributes? St. Lucy, virgin, martyr, propers or eyeballs and a tray, and St. Martin de Porres has his broom. And I feel in a way like Monsignor's attribute with Manuel talking obsessively all night about spotted cows and train schedules, which were apparently, and I, and I don't in any way say that to um, disrespect Manuel or his memory, because I kind of feel like 
Lorenzo Elvis was probably Manuel's attribute too. Um, but there's something so human about the brother, the brother connection. Um, so anyway, we can't get around suffering, Albacete observes, by trying to explain it away, nor by trying to be more tender toward the sufferer than God is. Catholic novelist and short story writer Flannery O'Connor observed that in the absence of faith, this is our culture, quote, we govern by a tenderness which long since cut off from the person of Christ is wrapped in theory. When tenderness is detached from the source of tenderness, its logical outcome is terror. It ends in forced labor camps and in the fumes of the gas chamber. And we see such tenderness today leading to elderly people, moneyless people, disabled people being urged to end their lives. I wouldn't want to be you, the group think goes, so let me help you not to be you by killing yourself. It ends in the abortion clinic. I wouldn't want to be born into poverty, and neither, I'm sure, with this child, let's put her out of her misery, etc. cetera. Um, and Albacete sums up, our contemporary culture employs a deeply mistaken approach to dealing with human suffering. And to illustrate further, he points out this Nathaniel Hawthorne sh short story in which a husband, Aylmer, A-Y-L-M-E-R, is married to Georgiana. Georgiana is beautiful. She has this tiny birthmark. And as we do with people, it's on her face, um, over time, Aylmer finds it increasingly repellent. And Georgiana, who's never given much thought to this minor imperfection, is hurt, bewildered, and finally appalled by her husband's reaction. You cannot love what shocks you, she exclaims. But Aylmer, unmoved, insists that Georgiana undergo surgery. She dies on the operating table. Um, and Monsignor writes, I think the refusal to be shocked or repulsed in the face of suffering is the calling of every Christian. We have to reach out to those who suffer with a profound acceptance of their agony instead of seeking to remove or destroy their experience. We cannot be blind to suffering. We cannot isolate those who suffer, nor can we use medical science to destroy the sufferer when our attempt to cure the disease has failed. Part of what Monsignor suffered, it seems, was his inability to schedule, return emails and phone calls, and keep books. Um, and for my own part, what shocks me most, what I'm perhaps least able to love, are the limitations and deformities in my own makeup. You know, I think, I think many of us find it easier, right? We're not, not as shocked <laughs> at other people. Um, anyway, I wonder, though, if these traits that cause us so much suffering, and this came to me as I was reading the book, and that we can't get rid of, no matter how hard we try, what Pierre Teilhard de Chardin called passive diminishments, if these are not really great gifts from God, without which we would simply become monstrous. I think those of us with a certain amount of kind of intelligence and drive and passion, uh, you know, become so efficient and successful that we wouldn't really be able to help anyone. And really, what do we love so much about Monsignor? I mean, there's many things, but part of it, I think, is his vulnerability, that he wasn't perfect. Um, so when we cease to be shocked by the suffering of either ourselves or our neighbors, we become protagonists. This is Monsignor in an ongoing drama. We're no longer bots in a humorless, culturally programmed wasteland we become free. And when we have discerned our course in freedom, we undergo whatever suffering that course may bring. To that end, it's impossible to regard Monsignor's life and fail to see the outline of, Cal of Christ's walk to Calvary. Like Christ, Monsignor chose to remain one of us. He worried about money, he had family dysfunction, he was nailed, as we are to our limitations, compulsions, habits. Over time, he was charged with the financial and emotional care of both his mother and brother, as well as the mundane demands of their collective daily life. 
And um, John Chewy writes, whether due to a tick of his personality or some deeper inner struggle, Lorenzo Albacete never felt he could adequately bear this burden. And man, you know, do any of us feel we can bear whatever our, our burden is? Um, his mother descends deeper into the ravages of Alzheimer's. Manuel becomes more paranoid, more of a recluse, more needy and demanding. With, with now two mentally ill persons entirely under my care, Monsignor notes in his journal during that time, my daily schedule was destroyed. I don't know about you, but that would be like the worst, kind of the worst suffering ever if I couldn't have my little routine, right? He suffers a stroke. He's hospitalized with Parkinson's. The night before he dies, two students, Vince and Gil, sit by his bedside. Grateful for their presence, he tells them, people are passing by and nobody ever stops. I'm so alone at night. Last night I was screaming and no one stopped. How could it be that someone who mentored, shepherded, ministered to, loved so many is left alone in his agony? This too is emblematic of our earthly suffering. But like Jesus, he has a couple of friends who stay with him till the end. He breathes his last, dawn breaks, he walks among us. And you know, I just want to say, I'm almost done, but last night I got to have dinner with a bunch of the, with the um, people here at the table, and, and maybe, eight, maybe there were eight or 10 of us at this table. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought, you know, at this ca table of Catholics, not once did anyone say, oh, can you believe they're giving Nancy Pelosi the Eucharist? <laughs> or like, <laughs> You know, we're like, oh, if the Vatican weren't such, such hypocrites, they'd sell their treasures and give it to the poor. You know, there's just no ideological, political. The whole conversation was, oh, let me tell a story about Monsignor. Oh, remember the time when he said this? Oh, he gave me a rosary. Oh, he gave, he, I've always remembered this simple thing that he said to me. It was all a celebration and love of this man. And I thought, that is why I... I never have to worry. The love of rain has been established, and the gates of hell will not prevail. You know, against the, against the church that, that Christ established on Peter, and that's how I know, because there was such love and respect for this wonderful man. Um, so anyway, and let's never forget that Monsignor Albacete uh, was a Catholic priest to the marrow of his bones, forever grounded in and sustained by the sacraments. He wrote, the truth is kept present in our world through the Eucharist, through which we join with the body of Christ. The model for this yes is given in the yes of Mary. And in fact, for all his incredibly rich theological insights and profound philosophical reflections, you could say that Monsignor's whole life his passion came down to this. He made a promise to his mother. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, Heather. Now we're going to listen to Dr. Lekic. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. I'm amazed at the turnout. It's like a Yankee game. <laughs> Sorry, Cardinal O'Malley. My connection to our dear Monsignor came by way of my friendship with Professor Bob Pollock at Columbia University and his close kinship with Monsignor. They both had sick brothers with similar problems. Bob is a former dean of Columbia University and I, we worked with undergraduates he approached me one day and asked if I could possibly take college students to the bedside at Terence Cardinal Cook, where I had been working at the time. We had HIV patients, we had Huntington's disease patients, elderly patients. We figured out a way to do that. And we had students for the last 15 years coming to the bedside, learning about the presence at the bedside, and then having discussions about it, reflections, and trying to really 
imbue in them the ability to become a co-sufferer. The program is still running, and it actually led to a service credit course at Columbia University for the first time in 250 years where they actually get credit for sitting at the bedside and thinking about it. Marvelous. Mentoring the students has taught me that impressionable young people, as many of the people we see in this room, who are inclined to serve others, can learn to open their hearts to be with those nearing the end of their lives. Initially, I got to meet Monsignor to help with some minor medical issues. I won't go into those, it's HIPAA. <laughs> Over time, this grew into a friendship and also the opportunity to later meet his brother Manuel and several high-ranking members of Monsignor's fan club, some of whom are here. <laughs> I'd like to share with you a personal experience that resonated with me as I read The Cry of the Heart. In June of 2009, it happened when I found an large ominous lymph node in my groin that was sure to be cancer. The workup proceeded rapidly to biopsy, and I was there, thereafter I was waiting breathlessly for the results of the biopsy. I suffered this worry mostly alone. A new void had opened in my whole being, and I really didn't have the means to fill it. Like someone might say at the death of a loved one, there's a hole in my heart. The threat to my future was especially resonant for me because as a physician, I had witnessed many of the out of the blue, life-changing events that happened to unsuspecting folks in their lives. There's always that terrifying week of waiting for the pathology report, waiting for the news from the doctor. So during a conversation with Monsignor about something else at the time, I paused and said, I would like to share something with you, Monsignor. And he said, please go on. I told him how worried I was at the prospect of hearing the worst, of seeing a big cloud over my future, of God knows what. After a pause, he quietly spoke, oh, I must accompany you. I will never forget the impact that these few words had on me. In his voice, on the phone no less, I could hear the totality of his concern, of his resonance with my worry, an empty feeling of something taken, my new lack, of which he speaks eloquently in the book. Make sure you buy it. The assault on the senses, the person, my future, all there hanging in the balance. I was craving something, solace, understanding, the comfort of my mother. As he references in the book where he speaks of a little boy whose faith, uh, who falls and scrapes his knee, he, he knows and cries out with pain, embarrassment, peeks at his mother, cries louder, and then runs for her comfort. The little boys cry from the heart. His voice to me as I hear it now was an embodiment, a verbalization, more a feeling of friendship, love, and as he offered, accompaniment. I felt no longer alone. As Monsignor writes, the possibility of going beyond the self is now made possible because of the suffering. I felt better immediately. A burden had been lifted, not entirely, of course, as the results were still a week away, but somehow were placed now in a context that I could deal with. I could accept much more willingly and even gratefully for whatever was to be my fate. The feeling was that no matter what I'm experiencing or confronting, career, threat, disability, mortality, that this in a powerful way was itself a gift and will always be and still is. It was an enlightenment experience that deeply defined for me the preciousness of the gift of life. It transcended the mundane, annealed my bonds to family, friends, and a human family. It forced me to focus and ponder on the ineffable emotional, spiritual dimensions of being human. It allowed me to enter what Professor Pollock described as the unknowable realm of our lives. Said in another way, it focused a new appreciation of the power of others, really important in this book, of others to comfort and nurture a troubled soul. It is no surprise that the greatest, prison, the greatest prevention of suicides is the presence of a loving hand. 
I'll turn now to comment on personal reflections as a physician and a person who attempts to be a healer or at least a co-sufferer when opportunity arises. Why is this with me? Why, why is this characteristic one of my characteristics? Why is it the characteristic of many of the people in this room, on this table, and all through the place today to try to help others, try to serve others? Sometimes it's good to look back and think about that. It seems to me, on my case, it started when I was about eight, when an old lady, old lady Menza in the, in the window in the Bronx, as I was running up the block, would bang on the window to get my attention. And I finally looked up, she opened the window and says, get me a newspaper, and she threw me a few pennies, three cents, not four dollars. <laughs> so I, I reflect on that, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe it was me resonating with her isolation. It may have resonated with the fact that my own grandmother sat in her window three, block, three houses down, isolated in, in many ways. And I, I felt that that little moment of satisfaction that she got from me was a connection. In a sense, it was a small dose of co-suffering. The physician has a catbird seat from which to observe suffering in its many forms. The theft of childhood by pediatric morbidity, the disfigurement of the young body by AIDS, the erosion of personality by dementia, and the bottomless pit of destructive mental illness. Through all these presentations of suffering, the common thread is deprivation, interruption of normalcy, threat to the future life as an adult, parent, provider, role in society, a legacy, with all of these, there's a calling out in Monsignor's words, a cry of the heart for an answer, soulless, unconditional motherly love, or in the context of Monsignor's words, in the form of a co-sufferer. Salve, you look it up, you Google it, Latin for hail, welcome, God be with you. In this context, it's to establish a genuine personhood to personhood, affect to affect, affect connection. Suffering is a complex mystery that must be lived and cannot be solved. You just heard him say that. Only attempted to be understood. In early Buddhism, suffering was the result of grasping, pinning our happiness to things that cannot and will not last, the occurrence of a perceived permanent lack. A different future is one that generates fear and disappointment. How can we really know anything how can we really know something that affects our personhood so deeply that enters into our unconscious? Here, Monsignor reminds us that suffering ignites the presence of the co-sufferer. Its redemption, its salve, is the newly realized presence of love that connects the sufferer with the co-sufferer. I felt his love on the phone and did it thereafter. And he was very solicitous, needless to say, afterwards. When, my, when, when Monsignor said I must accompany you, I didn't feel the pity or the tenderness that his and Flannery O'Connor's writings disparage and warn us against. It's not this I, you, and pity. Pity is bad. It felt the inner connections akin to meeting an ex-battlefield, akin to the meeting of ex-battlefield veterans, which I had experience with in, during the Vietnam War. When they meet each other, they have a shared history and context of their lives that is in, almost interchangeable, yet unknowable in its effect on their unconscious, their personhood, these soldiers, a camaraderie, even an inherent love for each other on the basis of that shared experience of war horror. Yet, often for the soldier suffering from PTSD, even the most devoted co-sufferer cannot reach them. As a physician during the Vietnam War who did not get deployed, I always felt the barrier in my best efforts to understand the PTSD, the addictions, the hurt from the societal rejection upon their return. Sort of like Jesus in the garden. There was a new void in them that my doctor role could not address. In working for so many years in the nursing home and homebound elderly setting, the common theme is loss, function, cognition, agency, aspirations, and so much more. Yet with some, it was possible to kindle a connection. 
Often I would walk through the nursing home and after being de there day after day, I would start to develop little eye contact, little moments of connection with the old folks and young folks in the case of HIV or in the specialty hospital. We have severely disabled, uh, developmentally disabled children often uh, speak without speech on ventilators, just looking and getting the love from the caregivers in the home. So I would try to connect like a hummingbird, little connections with these folks. And at times, I felt there was a co-suffering moment. I would share the moment with them in that, in that room. In the case of Huntington's disease, where we have in arch care over 100 patients, uh, north and south, up in Ferncliff and down in Manhattan. So I like to say at meetings, I had a 1,000 patient year experience with Huntington's disease, which is a lot. Uh, they, Huntington steals your facial expression, the prosody of your speech. It's a flat affect. It can, it can change personality. It can also uh, affect behaviors and um, uh, is a very, very long road of suffering. My most powerful moment as a co-sufferer came in connection with a Huntington's patient, Chuck. He was in his 30s and would scream out and rebel and had anger. He was emaciated and really at the end stage of Huntington's. He was OCD, and if you didn't have the right T-shirt on him, he would run up to my office in a wheelchair and smash my plants. So I would often say, Chuck, please, not the plants, and I'd put him in the wheelchair and I'd take the elevator down, go into Central Park so we could get some air. So one day I came back in from the park, brought him into his room. He was getting tired, and he said, help me, help me into bed. He was about 95 pounds, six feet tall. So I said, you know, I think I could do this myself. The aides are all overworked. So I picked him up in my arms and stood there for fleetingly as I put him into bed. And I sat down and I started to weep. I really started to sob. And he said, what's the matter, Doc? I said, Chuck, when I when I held you in my arms, you're the same size and shape as my son. And I realized it could have been him. And he said, it's gonna be okay, Doc. In his anger, in his wildness, for that moment, we really did change places. And I've never felt it stronger than that moment. Every time I tell this story, I drop a tear. I used to give lectures to medical students from uh, New York Med and uh, Cornell. Every time I told them this, and I did it for a purpose, maybe a little drama, I don't know. But I wanted the kids to see me feeling what I felt at that moment. So when I held him, I really felt him in my arms. And so it worked on so many levels uh, that uh, to this day, I think I reached some kind of transcendent moment at that time. So I think I entered into the unknowable with him. I think it stems from my efforts to normalize him by bringing him in the park. It was my wish that he would, we would do something like young guys do together, look at the park, uh, see what's going on, and so on. But that moment just transformed and crashed. But he came to my aid, which was really incredible. So. There are times, though, as a co-sufferer, you can be completely powerless. There was one particular patient I'll never forget. She was racked with dementia, agitated dementia. She could not stop yelling and screaming in pain and horror and yelling. The staff would come to her bedside. We got her cat out of the apartment that the neighbors were taking care of, brought it and put it on her lap in the bed, and it didn't work. So the staff and I tried our best and at the end, all we could do was try to comfort each other because it was really impossible and hope and pray and care plan that somehow this would come to a merciful ending. So I think in that instance, you become part of a family of caregivers and you can be spread among the team as I think we're doing today. So let me close by thanking Monsignor posthumously for the enlightenment that he bestowed on all of us. 
as we face our own heartache and pain, as well as that of, as well as that of others. We see it on the TV every night. They like to focus on suffering, particularly Turkey and Syria right now. Monstrous authoritarianism in Iran, going back to the Holocaust, extremism in Afghanistan, even natural disasters like the earthquake and floods. Perhaps we can co-suffer from afar, thereby entering by way of attitude, social awareness and prayer, the world of suffering that Monsignor spoke of. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lekic. Um, now, Dan, please. Check, check. All right. All right. I guess we're OK. I guess I'll start off here just with a little disclaimer and confession. I'm not uh, used to public speaking. It's not, <laughs> not something I'm known for, for sure. Um, I was outside uh, about a half an hour ago with uh, one of my close friends, and we were trying to come up with different ways that I could uh, get around this, uh, this <laughs> talk today, including, <laughs> I don't know, depending on your powers of perception, you might tell that I'm not well in the, in a few ways, but uh, you know he thought maybe um, uh, Andy Kaufman esque situation where I could just sit and you guys could all watch me suffer uh, together. <laughs> we could all co suffer for about fifteen minutes or so um, but uh, um, a second option at some point if uh, the, the talk 's not going well i 'll just grab my chest and <laughs> You guys will be too chicken to say anything because uh, you know, nobody wants to judge a cancer survivor. So it's <laughs> um, uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm, uh, I come from a, a small, very, very small town in uh, central Minnesota called Farming. I grew up on a, on a beef farm. I was homeschooled um, through third grade through end of high school and uh, made the um, interesting choice of uh, moving to New York City for college uh, in the beginning of September in 2001. Um, I remember one of my first days uh, traveling to class in the morning with, with one of my classmates and we were crossing the Manhattan Bridge and we, uh, the train stopped and they said that there was some traffic um, due to a fire in the World Trade Center and we all leaned over, out the, looking out the window at the smoke billowing out of one of the towers. And in that moment, um, the second plane came in. And uh, we had no idea what was going on. But uh, when the second plane hit, um, there was this, this woman next to me who just started um, crying um, uncontrollably and wailing. Uh, we stopped at Canal Street uh, in, in Chinatown and had to get off. That was the last stop um, due to the situation. And I remember stepping out this, you know, starry-eyed, um, just like totally, um, I don't know, um, just uh, this little kid from the small town uh, in Minnesota witnessing this, this thing and, and the woman I remember it's I'm trying to figure out how to navigate the, a different path to get to, to get to school. This, this, this woman stepped out of the train and uh, she took the handkerchief that she had been crying into and wrung it out, creating a puddle on the floor in the subway. And I remember thinking, I mean, that was the first time in my, in my life that I said, having the thought that there's no, there's nothing I can do to respond to, to this. This is an, something too painful, um, I don't know, to, to have an answer um, in that moment. Um, so while um, at, at that point I was seriously questioning uh, my decision to, <laughs> to, to make the jump out to, New York City. 
Um, I, little did I know that it was also the, a step that was going to um, cause me to meet um, Lorenzo Albacete, who became a very dear friend of mine. Um, our relationship started out as um, him becoming my confessor. He was available for confession through some people I knew, and he happened to be uh, at the CL office. Um, and I made a trip down there from uh, from school one day and met him. Um, I won't go into the sins confessed that day, but uh, <laughs> I will say that uh, part of my penance was uh, to get some food from a street car outside. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> just to give you an idea of my first interaction with, with Albacete. Um, <laughs> Uh, later on, we had um, in, in 2005 just to, just another little story that I, I hold dear in my heart uh, gives an idea of Albacete. Many of many of you who know may know if you've uh, if you knew him or been to other talks or read read some things about him. You know he had this very interesting or watched uh, the Albacete show actually, um, which was a very beautiful film. Um, that he had a tenuous uh, relationship with uh, St. Anthony, and uh, he was often losing things, and he believed that uh, if, if uh, he prayed to St. Anthony that he would never, ever rediscover any lost item. Um, <laughs> that, I, um, I took a trip uh, down to a, uh, a retreat, a diaconia down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, uh, being a poor kid in uh, in Brooklyn at the time, I um, I had a, I had a car uh, and I rounded up some other poor kids. Um, uh, there were college students, and the four of us took my old you know 1990 uh, car down to down to Fort Lauderdale from Brooklyn. Um, for the most part, the trip was okay, except for I found out after about 12 hours, I tried to switch uh, with somebody else to drive and found out that, like, um, I, I was totally ignorant of this fact, but apparently nobody in New York has a driver's license. Uh, so, <laughs> so we pushed through, and uh, towards the end, by between Jacksonville and Fort Lauderdale, they had taken to just punching me in the shoulder to keep me awake until we could get down there. And... Um, is there uh, one of the people in the car who was helping to punch me was uh, a good good friend of mine, Swan, who um, was part of a group of four people that uh, Albacete often lovingly referred to as his bastards. Um, <laughs> and uh, we got down there, and um, uh, during the trip, this is sort of just to give some some context. Uh, there was a lot of crazy stuff that happened. Um, one of which being that uh, on a trip to the beach, suddenly there was a, a pretty intense tropical storm that just dropped um, out of nowhere. I was maybe at the beach for five minutes before the sky turned green and everything went crazy. Somebody, some people went to go grab the vans that we had been transported to the beach in, and. Um, the, there was a torrential downpour, and we were taking shelter by a, a bathroom there. And uh, once the vans pulled up, they were about a half a block down on the other side of the parking lot. And we started uh, just making a run for it to the van. I was the last person. Uh, and right before I got to the van, um, I didn't witness this because I was there running, but all the people in the van's uh, jaws dropping, um, told me something was up, but uh, apparently I've been told that as I was running there, a lightning bolt came almost directly down on top of me and then split in two and hit a light post and a tree. <laughs> so in, uh, in light of all this, the things that happened there, um, Elvis said that before we left on our return trip, he gave us a rosary um, and uh, we said a prayer of uh, protection for our trip back. Um, 
We drove about three hours before my car blew a rod in the middle of the night, and we got stuck sleeping on a park bench uh, outside of a Greyhound bus stop um, after almost being arrested falsely of drug possession. Uh, <laughs> so, St. Anthony might not be fulfilling Elvis Day's prayers, of that, but I, I don't think that he should be the patron saint, possibly, of uh, safe travels either. <laughs> Um, so on the topic, as um, both Heather and uh, Anthony mentioned, that uh, the, the strong theme in this book is that of uh, co-suffering. Um, in that, I just wanted to share um, some some co-suffering that uh, you know we. Uh, I think people sort of universally probably um, have have witnessed in their in their own lives. Um, I remember a particular spring um, filled with uncertainty and not well knowing what was what was happening, um, beginning to wear masks everywhere, not being able, not people not seeing your face, and adapting to working from home and being isolated, being filled with anxiety and not being able to tell my kids that things were going to be okay in an honest way, social distancing, um, everybody, and sort of just um, confronting mortality really for the first time um, ever, you know, and everyone thinks they're immortal until something happens in their life, um, being scared, and then in the fall, um, you know, this disease mutating and, you know, after, after thinking we're sort of through the worst of it, um, suddenly finding out that there's this, this new threat and, and when's this going to end. And, um, so um, now at the time that this was happening, uh, I could not have imagined that this would be a common uh, common thing that uh, or experience that I would I would share with many people, and I had no reason to believe it because I was I just described uh, the year I just described as 2019 for me. Um, at the end of uh, 2018, I was uh, suddenly diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and. Uh, I had um, a bone marrow transplant um, in the spring of, uh, of 2019, and there's lots of uh, safety protocols in a uh, hundred days of isolation. Um, so I experienced, I sort of had a, uh, I don't know, I, I guess I had, I got to have some practice for COVID before it actually happened. So I had a, a year of that just being away from the family and um, it was just, just to, to say I really um, was intrigued by um, this book, um, talking about how while we, while we all share in suffering, there is this, this universal suffering. It is the, the situation of, of man that uh, each suffering is both common and universal, but also entirely and completely unique. Um, however, um, yeah, it just uh, sort of sort of blew my mind. I, I really, in spring of 2020, I was like, this cannot be happening. I'm not, <laughs> not doing this another year. But uh, I guess um, we were able to, to, to share in it. But uh, uh, in that during that time, um, I also um, saw a lot of beauty and things that I, I, I could not have uh, expected or um, really believed were gonna were gonna happen. And a good friend of mine and a, a very very close friend of Albacete Olivetta Danese came to visit me when I was in the hospital. Uh, for the transplant, and she, we shared with each other some things I 
spoke about the in all of the I don't know in, in all that had happened um, the cancer and the and the suffering and the pain uh, involved in it the fear that not in spite of that but partially because of it um, I really saw um, myself as having been this little kid in this um, middle of nowhere in Minnesota being plucked out of history and that he came down and said you I want to show you this beauty these beautiful things and uh, Olivetta reminding me of um, Albacete is uh, his refrain that he often often said which was uh, recalling Christ's words of, don't be afraid, it's me. That uh, all of these things in life um, that we suffer, um, that are scary, that it is a, it's a sign of, of Christ's love and his co-suffering with us. And that it's not something to be afraid of, but something to walk forward towards. So um, I guess I will close here with another uh, quote of Albacete that um, I always found pleasurable, which was, uh, which was uh, or the talk has ended, uh, let's go eat pizza. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. to deeply thank our three speakers. I will close uh, with uh, something that Lorenzo himself told me. As I said, I met him um, the last six years of his life. When I came to New York, he was no longer able to go out of New York. He was no longer to travel anymore, and he loved traveling. And one time speaking, he told me that he used to love his life of his public life, where he would go around traveling, talking, giving talks at important events, having people wanting to talk to him after the talks. He said to me, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. <laughs> um, he was no longer to travel because of the condition that Manuel was in. And he said to me, I sometimes think of what I used to do and, and I miss it. But what I have learned of Christ in these six years of suffering, I would not change for the world. <laughs> I, it's, it's incomparable what I have learned of Jesus in these six years of, uh, to what I used to do. And so this was Lorenzo. Um, this is what what he left us. There was no other reason to bear suffering in this world than to know Christ. And to know Christ made the cross sweet for him. And I feel the privilege of having seen that. Um, so for those of you who are interested in the book, we have the book available downstairs at the forum table and also at the human adventure table and at the slant table. <laughs> um, if you want to know more information about Lorenzo, you can come to the Albacete Forum table and we will gladly tell you about him and about his works. We want to thank all of our speakers, but also Somos for supporting the Cry of the Heart. And, um, and we would like you to Enjoy the rest of the New York encounter. <laughs>